How's it going everyone? Just wanted to let y'all know that this episode was both a special Patreon request and a long time suggestion from two fans who have been with me for a while now. If it wasn't for their input, this whole Hunger Games revival wouldn't have happened in the first place. So a massive thank you to both Anna Fuentes and Daniel Neal for your continuous support over the years. And I hope to count on it more for future reviews. And if you currently have a BVM request in mind that you'd like me to review one day, the community list on my Patreon is currently open for new suggestions. Both $1 and $5 tier members are available to contribute, so please consider joining if interested. Thank you, and please enjoy the review. Podcast station week narration from the point of retain the final relation to the pointless plot description is open and the Romans held some of the thousand yards there. Book is thick, but nothing will stick. I take my chances. Well, well, that flick, but the worst of all, the reason I weep, we didn't get far on the eight pages deep. Where can I find this story? Bookstore's closed, the cafe's packed, nothing left to do but sing a little rap. Well, for now, I'll just be weeping. Yeah, and take some time to come read with me. How's it going bookworms, filmsters, my name is Mike and welcome back to another BVM review. After revisiting the first two books of this trilogy, it is finally time to discuss Mockingjay. I am so glad I decided to refresh myself on the events and prepare myself for the ending of this adventure. And boy do I have some thoughts with this final installment. But first, to recap our last discussion, Katniss's influence as a rebellious symbol has landed her back to the terrors of the 75th annual Hunger Games. However, much to the capital's surprise, several districts and the head game maker himself were planning a breakout for the Mockingjay to aid in their war against the capital. The story of Catching Fire served its purpose to push Katniss further into her role as the leading symbol for a new Pan Am. While I did appreciate the book's effectiveness as a sequel, I preferred the movie's version that just tightened the narrative and left out some parts that personally didn't land with me. So far, the movies have done a great job condensing the book down to movie length, so I had confidence Mockingjay could have done just as well with a single movie. But following the success of The Deathly Hollows, it decided to split itself into two parts. Double the trauma, double the profits. I actually haven't seen these movies since their theatrical releases in the mid-2010s, so along with just pointing out as many differences as I can, I'll also be answering the question if this story actually needed to split. We have a lot to discuss today, so sit back and relax as we conclude Katniss's story and see where it all lands for the Rebels, the Capitol, and everything in between. This is... Mockingjay. So part one begins with a scared Katniss in hiding until some District 13 medics find and drag her back to her hospital bed. One thing we should establish right away is the time differences between book and movie. In the book, Katniss has already been with the rebels for about a month and has slowly grown accustomed to their lifestyle. To a degree, she's somewhat recovered from the quarter quell but still had a lot to do to keep her sanity together. In the movie though, it's only been a couple of days since the rescue, which allowed for these new characters and dynamics to be properly introduced as opposed to their quick introductions from the book. Also, this opening scene was not how the book originally started, but it's a decent alternative as the movie offered the audience a short recap through a memory technique Katniss used frequently in the book to help her confirm things that she knew were true. My name is Katniss Everton. So remember that whack she got from Joanna before the big split off? The book goes into more detail about this injury and how it gave her a serious concussion, jumbling her thoughts together and making it hard to sort out the true memories from the false ones. So when she arrived at District 13 for treatment, one of the doctors suggested using this technique to help her restore her memory, starting with small, simple truths and slowly working towards the more complicated ones. However, even with the book's one month time skip, she still carried a heavy load of PTSD and trauma on her shoulders. 
So doing those mental exercises and recalling those memories were still strong enough to frequently bring her down to this position we see in the movie. Hunched over, head in her hands, completely scared out of her wits. Although part of that fear could also be in reference to the hallucinogenic effects from the drugs controlling her pain and mood. As described in the book, her medication had a tendency to make her see things, such as the one night when the floor turned into a carpet of writhing snakes, so I can understand why she wouldn't want to go back. It's just fine. Don't touch me. Don't. No. She's brought back to her room, keeping her thoughts and sanity focused on this pearl rubbed between her fingers. And this bothers me. You see, I actually did write something about the pearl scene for my Catching Fire review, but scrapped it because it seemed like the locket was going to be the primary token of remembrance. I didn't see the Mockingjay movies and just assumed this. So for that, I apologize. But now that I have seen Mockingjay in this entirety, I do need to spend a minute talking about this pearl because it gets brought up a couple of times, even though the movies never gave it that much significance like the locket, at least in my opinion. Going back to the end of book two, an hour before the lightning strike, the group decided to have one last meal together, and Peter happened to find this pearl in one of the oysters. This was his last gift to Katniss before their separation, acting as both a representation of his desire to keep her alive and a memory of her failure to keep him safe and close. With that context, it makes sense why this pearl would mean so much to her, at least to me. Now, I know the significance of this pearl. People who have read the book know the significance of this pearl. I don't think the movie did any favors to the viewers to find any significance with this pearl. For one thing, it wasn't the last thing Katniss received from him. The scene takes place after fighting off the monkeys and watching the District 6 victor taken away and is only given like two minutes of screen time before continuing the plot forward. The movie placed more attention on the locket to be his last gift to her, along with this incredible speech attached to it. And this leads into my next point, there's nothing special about this scene. It might as well have been a throwaway because it lacked any impression. No music cue, no grand speech, Peter's just like here you go and that's basically it. It's worth noting that this scene in the book also didn't have that much attention either, but the fact that this gesture made quite an impression on Katniss is what gave it importance. Whereas in the movie you could have sneezed or checked your communicators during this scene and completely missed it. Coming back to this scene in Mockingjay, turning to your friend and just asking, so what's the deal with this pinball? She got finger cramps or what's going on here? In conclusion, it seemed like a weak choice to turn the pearl into a primary token when the locket would have been a more effective choice for these two parts. Could have been fiddling with the chain, taking long glances at the pictures, literally anything else but the pearl. Anyway, she escapes her room and visits a broken Finnick, who remains in this fragmented mindset for the majority of part one due to the fact that his precious Annie was also taken by the capital. Yet, however troubled our heroes are at the moment, the president of District 13, President Coin, is on a tight schedule and needs to get things moving. As soon as Katniss is discharged, she is requested for a meeting and escorted by the district's head of security, Colonel Boggs. This escort gives us and Katniss a view of the district's living situation, along with a history lesson that makes the capital more of a threat than how they were described in the book. Here, Colonel Bogg says that the district was forced underground after the capital carpet bombed their surface. But that wasn't much of an issue because, as he says here, but We're military, so we learn to survive down here. Yet, in the book, the citizens of District 13 have lacked military experience at the start and until recently couldn't handle all the weapons at their disposal. Also, their war in the capital began on even terms. Since District 13 was in charge of the capital's nuclear weapons development program, they took control of the base and aimed those weapons at the capital, proposing a very simple deal. Leave us alone and we'll play dead for you. At the time, the capital couldn't retaliate, so they reluctantly agreed and staged the destruction of District 13. The capital hoped the people would die off from the lack of provided resources, which happened a few times, but the citizens managed to survive through strict disciplinary methods that were just non-existent in the film. One point that the book often demonstrated was the slight comparisons between the rebels and the capital. 
We've had two whole books learning how the capital ruled with immense control and oppression. And now with Mockingjay introducing the rebels who the districts have placed all their hopes in, we start to see that they aren't so different in terms of their own form of control. They enforce rules and preservation with an iron fist. They won't tolerate anyone who's wasteful with resources or carries a disregard for their strict policies. One foot out of line can often result in extreme punishment and imprisonment. All citizens are given mandatory schedules in the form of temporary tattoos that they follow to maintain order and organization. This strict environment was something that Katniss couldn't comply to, and she would often skip her duties and responsibilities to hide out and nap in an abandoned air duct, which was represented in the opening scene. And yet, although the movie decided to stretch out the story and begin with a fresh arrival to District 13, it lacks any of that world building you see in the book and stays focused on moving the plot forward, which is honestly a little disappointing. But I'm not nearly as disappointed as President Coyne was when she met Katniss for the first time. This meeting, more than anything else in this movie, is evidence for the different points in time between book and movie because it was clear right away that she did not want to collab with the Mockingjay. Maybe you should have rescued the boy instead. Still heated about PETA, Katniss refuses to cooperate with them. But Plutarch isn't quick to give in and decides to refocus her anger by sending her back to District 12 and see the Capitol's handiwork. This is how Mockingjay originally started in the book and was a much stronger opening than what the movie offered. Like, remember how the previous book and movie ended with that cliffhanger? There is no District 12. And then right away, the first chapter of this book confirms that statement through Katniss's very own eyes. This series has been pretty good at starting each book in her home district, and this one was by far the most devastating, as she's taken a walk through these familiar streets we have grown to know in the previous books, now a complete ghost town, layered with the corpses of its previous residents. The only place that remained intact was the Victor's Village, and after collecting Prim's cat and a few of her personal belongings, Katniss finds a perfectly white rose in the study where Snow threatened her, centered amongst the dead flowers. She looks at this rose with such dread, and the book supports this expression by detailing Katniss's interpretation of this rose, seeing it as a promise of revenge and unfinished business, as if he was letting her know that he was always watching. And in the next scene, everyone's watching him as he delivers a speech to all the other districts, maintaining his control and making sure that they understand what would happen if they start aligning themselves with the quote unquote radicals. In the book, this message was part of an abundance of footage the District 13 officials would watch and review during their meetings to stay informed, and would also include the first interview between Caesar and Peta. Katniss is the only one happy to see him alive, while the rest of the district is labeling him as a traitor for trying to call for a ceasefire. Gale does his best to soothe their thoughts saying that he's been forced to comply in order to keep her safe, which is evident by the way he tried to remove any blame off her shoulders. Katniss is the one who blew it out. She, she didn't know what she was doing. Neither of us knew there was a bigger plan going on. We had no idea. But she just can't seem to shake him off to the point where she hallucinates his presence after having the nightmare, reminiscent of the scene in Catching Fire where he promised to stay with her always. Such a short emotional scene that captured her current emotions and perfectly transitioned into another heartwarming moment with Prim climbing into bed with her sister, listening to her worries about the idea of Peter returning to an execution and reminding her the perks of being a Mockingjay and what that symbol entails. I don't think you know how important you are to them. You want something? You just have to ask. So now Katniss has some demands if they want her to be their Mockingjay. She requests just two things, the rescue and immunity of both the captured victors in any Cresta and to keep the cat in their living quarters. She had more demands in the book, like hunting above the surface with Gale, having Gale by her side throughout her Mockingjay duties, the promise to kill Snow personally, and making a public announcement of this deal so there could be witnesses. The movie just makes half of these demands happen without request while the other half are paced alongside the plot and treated like rewards whenever Katniss did a good job with her task. I got good news. What? 
Coin agreed to let us hunt above ground. With Plutarch bending her ear, President Coin agrees to Katniss's demands, beginning the start of the Propos team, which is responsible for creating propaganda to inspire and fuel the flames of the rebellion. Plutarch doesn't waste any time and begins assembling the team, starting with our favorite escort, Effie Trinket, who's been sitting in the room feeling like a prisoner when in reality, she could just leave whenever. This was one of the biggest changes from the book for two reasons. The first being Effie herself. She's barely in the story and only appeared at the very end, noted to have been imprisoned by the capital. It was actually the rest of Katniss's prep team who were residing here in District 13. The second change was big enough to contradict Plutarch's words here. You're not a prisoner. You're free to join the rest of 13. Those three were exactly that. Prisoners. In the book, Katniss reunited with them in their prison cell after repeated offenses of stealing bread to fill their newfound experience of hunger. They were found chained to the walls, half naked, bruised up, and were too fearful of Katniss approaching them as if they were anticipating some kind of attack. It makes sense why the movie would make this change though. We had much more of an attachment for Effie's character, so her appearance and inclusion for this team would have been much better received than the other three. But why was the movie able to make an appropriate change here, yet not with the Pearl? Well... After the public announcement of the deal is made, Katniss reunites with Effie in the cafeteria and is given one last gift from Cinna once she decided to accept the role of the Mockingjay. Even after his death, Cinna was making sure that she was going to rebel in style with a new armored uniform that saved her life numerous times in this story. Now if only he made something to help with her acting skills. We dare to end this hunger for justice! Maybe you should have rescued the boy instead. Shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. We all know how awkwardly she performs on camera without Peter or some guidance. In this very first shoot, she just has to recite one line for a slogan, but it's just not happening. She was so bad, Hamish had to come out of rehab just to roast her. And that, my friends, is how a revolution dies. This will mark Hamish's return to the story, and it took so long because he was battling out with some withdrawal symptoms. The book went into more detail about District 13 prohibiting any production or consumption of alcohol, forcing our favorite mentor on the healing path to sobriety. But now he's back with a cool beanie, and he attaches himself to the project, educating the Propos team on how to work with Katniss. The end of his little exercise that highlighted all of Katniss's greatest moments showed everyone that she works better unscripted and would give a stronger performance if she played an active role in the war. This scene in the book did a lot to start forming a small but welcoming relationship between Katniss and Colonel Boggs. Up to this point, she's seen him as nothing more than the lackey to present coin. But after hearing him bring up her farewell to Rue and his concerns for her to be taken to District 8, he was becoming more of an ally in her eyes. The movie gave practically all his lines to other characters, leaving him with just a suggestion about her makeup. And wash her face. She's still a girl, you made her look 35. The team decides to do some filming in District 8 since they've recently undergone an attack. So there's no way it could be hit twice. Before departing, Katniss and Gale pay a visit to BT in this special defense room to collect their personalized weapons. In the book, this visit came before her first shooting so she could act with some real looking prop items. But BT made some modifications to make sure they weren't just for show, but also combat ready. One of the aspects the movie didn't include was the voice activation feature that would change Katniss's bow from a prop item to a lethal bow and would only work to her voice specifically. Once they're armed, they make their way towards the hovercraft and meet the rest of the Propos team, two of which I recognized very fondly. Cressida played by Natalie Dormer and Pollux played by Eldon Henson. Now me personally, I'm a fan of Netflix's Daredevil series, and to see that Foggy Nelson was a part of these movies had me so excited until I remembered the nature of his character. Don't expect much chit chat from him. He's an AVOX. Capital cut his tongue out years ago. The one actor I actually wanted to hear interact with his cast, and he turned out to be a freaking AVOX of all things. Just my luck.
The team arrive at District 8 and are escorted by Commander Paylor to the makeshift hospital, giving the wounded rebels some hope as they witness the Mockingjay alive and ready to fight for the cause. Unfortunately for her, that fight comes a little too quickly as President Snow picked up her location via a surveillance camera and sends an airstrike to kill the wounded and emotionally wounding her in the process. This scene in the book was a lot more intense, mainly for the fact that they were dealing with seven bombers instead of two, but still having no issue taking them down with precise arrow shots. However, the damage was already done and Snow got what he wanted, but he also gave Katniss the rage she needed to send a powerful message that solidified her siding with the rebels and reminded the president just how badly Snow can melt. And if we burn, you burn with us! The Propolis team returns to base with incredible footage to create this inspiring video that spans across the districts through BT's expansion of the broadcast systems, bringing more rebels to the cause, and fight off every inch of oppression. For a job well done, Katniss and Gale are granted access to hunt above ground, which doesn't feel the same back home since the animals here have existed without the fear of humans, so they have no idea what being hunted feels like. This scene would also try to squeeze in some intimacy between Katniss and Gale before he's called back to base, initiating the start of their separating paths. Their relationship was another difference from how it was portrayed in the book, because it was a lot more apparent that their connection was beginning to drift. The first example of this came right after rescuing her prep team from their imprisonment, with Gale showing his explicit hatred for the capital and Katniss defending these people who she personally knew were harmless. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's been following along with the story. From what we know so far, for both book and movie, Gale is anti-capital. And if you relive this series through his perspective, there's enough there to support these feelings. However, what sets Mockingjay apart from the previous installments is that now he can actually do something about it. Before, it was just talks and wishful thinking, thoughts that Katniss never took seriously because it wasn't going to lead into actual change. But now with the introduction of the rebellion, those feelings and motives are taken more seriously and his voice and opinions are playing an active role favored by the rebels. You can see it in this deleted scene of Katniss and Gale meeting BT in this garden sanctuary where he's studying hummingbirds. I don't know why this was taken out of the final version since it's a vital scene for the story as a whole, but it puts the spotlight on Gale's hunting knowledge and how it could be useful to the rebels, especially the part about understanding your prey. Thinking like your prey is where you find their vulnerabilities. I personally wouldn't have minded more scenes like this instead of the ticking time bomb that was their romance. Mockingjay was milking this romance for all it's worth. Like, this was a story that began to eliminate the image of them ever ending up together. Collins was making that point very clear, but the movies weren't going to rush in that direction. Otherwise, how else were they going to clear out that warehouse full of Team Gale t-shirts? It's another reason why I believe Part 1 started near the arrival of District 13. Just to give enough time to keep this relationship going and watch its descent in real time. But even if that was the case, it's still handled pretty poorly because it still will have to juggle plot based events that make these characters turn against each other. I mean, just take a look at the scene that comes after this one. One minute these two are enjoying each other's company only to immediately be at each other's throats after the second interview between Caesar and Peta, who's looking a lot more pale and malnourished than before. This second broadcast also differentiated from the book as it had its own bit of drama based on Peta's concerns for Katniss placing all her trust with the rebels. She watched this with Finnick in her hospital room and made a pact to pretend they never seen it. Whether Gale saw it or not was the main reason for their argument, and not just because he feigned ignorance, but because he feigned ignorance for coin and the rebellion. It was a moment that further supported Peta's claim and allowed Katniss to see where her friend's allegiance was. This scene in the movie was more useful as a transition to give him a reason to visit District 12 again because the argument here just makes no sense. We can all see alongside Katniss that Peta's being controlled, but Gale is more upset by what he's saying. Like, bro, weren't you the one who just said this? Why do you think he said that? I don't know, maybe he was forced. 
You don't have any idea what he's going through. I don't through. care. I would never say what he just said. I can only guess that this was the movie's way to establish the line between his allegiance to Katniss or the Rebels, with him leaning more towards the Rebels. But in any case, this relationship just lacks the smooth, gradual pacing from the book and was handled badly due to the movies trying to juggle accuracy and profits. And I would love nothing more than to take this conversation away from Gale, but that isn't going to be possible since he and the Propolis team returned to District 12 in an attempt to show Peter and the Capitol the aftermath that was hidden from them. I like how the movie reworked Gale's retelling of the District 12 bombing here since it was covered in the very first chapter of the book, but I don't like how things went down in this kitchen. Sharing the kiss that was less out of love and more to prove a point. I knew you'd do that. Because I'm in pain. That's the only way that I can get your attention. In the book, the moment came right after the team's lunch break, when the wild Mockingjay appeared before Katniss and Pollux, and Pollux insisted that she sing something. Katniss initially started with the tune Rue whistled in the first story, but because that started to bring back traumatic memories, she decided to revive a song her dad used to sing, titled The Hanging Tree. Now, I don't know who remembers this, but this song became a sensation after part one came out. Like, I remember riding in the passenger seat one day, turning on the radio, and was just surprised people were already making a remix out of it. Like, that's something the Capitol would do. Could you imagine the reality where the Capitol ended up winning, and they took the remix of this song to those Capitol nightclubs, high on morphine and dancing to the death of their enemies? A morbid thought? I'll admit. But hey, no complaints, at least the beat is still fresh. Oh! The Propos team filmed another banger in their hands and shaped the song to fit their agenda. This video was so inspiring that it got the rebels from District 5 motivated enough to take down their hydroelectric dam, blow out the power in the capital, and give BT access to send rebel propaganda towards PETA and its citizens. He finally got a taste of these propos in his third interview, and seeing Katniss alive was enough to pull him out of his trance and give him enough control to deliver an urgent message. They're coming Katniss. They're gonna kill everyone. And in District 13 you'll be dead by morning! Realizing this was a warning about an incoming air raid, President Coyne issues a drill to move the citizens towards the lower levels. And let me tell you, the level of chaos was drastically different between book and movie. Since the book was clear on District 13's heavily enforced protocols, the drill went as smooth as possible. The raid took its time to arrive, allowing Katniss to reach the lower levels, find her designated compartment, and familiarize herself with a protocol sheet while patiently waiting for her family to arrive. However, in the movie, it was absolute chaos. The immediate attack from the raid made the transition incredibly stressful. The bombing cut out the lights during their descent, throwing everyone into panic, almost having Katniss trampled until a kind soul helps guide her to the bunkers, only to learn that Prim went back for the cat. Luckily, she and Gail weren't too far behind and they all stay secure behind the blast doors and wait out the bombing. I like this moment better in the book because the stillness allowed Katniss to connect and tighten bonds with certain characters. However, the movie makes certain cuts to transform these conversations for plot driven purposes. For starters, this exchange between Katniss and Prim was a lot sweeter in the book as Katniss realized that she hasn't had much time to check in on her baby sister like she used to. And this led to a nice conversation about how she's taken the change or even the exciting news of being trained as a doctor, which is used in the movie more as a distraction than a genuine topic of interest. Come talk about something, anything. In fact, if it wasn't for this moment of sister bonding, Katniss wouldn't have come closer to understanding what Prim meant when she said President Snow wouldn't kill Peta, but use him as a means to break her. The realization comes to her while playing with Buttercup, as she imagined herself as the cat and Peta as the light. All this time, she thought the Capitol was holding him for information on the rebels, never really considering that he was being held to personally wound her. And that's when she realized that this is what Finnick has been struggling with this entire movie. Since he already knew why they took Annie from him. To torture him, taunt him, and keep control over his actions. This led to a tender moment in the book filled with apologies, connecting through their mental distraught over their loved ones, and the best possible advice to help keep her wits together. It takes ten times longer to put yourself back together than it does to fall apart. 
honestly, after reading and watching this scene, I wish we have gotten more time to spend with Finnick. If there was any character who deserved more moments, it should have been Finnick. With all that's been going on with Gale in this story, Collins could have made more room to connect with Finnick and reach deeper emotions with his character, which does happen. But not before Katniss is woken up by Colonel Boggs, taking the president coin, and told to begin a new propo shoot to show that the rebels survived the raid. However, when the team returns to the surface, they find themselves surrounded by a layer of white roses, which disrupts Katniss's ability to perform because, with what she learned during the wait, President Snow will continue to hurt Peeta if she keeps playing the role of the Mockingjay. She hides away in her secret spot, later visited by Haymitch who tells her that the team is being sent to rescue Peeta, Joanna, and Annie from the capital. Because of the damn incident in District 5, BT could continue to send live broadcasts to the capital, simultaneously jamming the systems and cause enough of the distraction for the rescue team to save Annie and the captured victors. Feeling like she can do more than sit in the sidelines, Katniss decides to help and buy some time for the extraction. In the book, the order of who went first was reversed and altered since Katniss originally went before Finnick, doing a simple Q&A segment on PETA, the relationship, and ending with a personal message to Snow. A lot of that footage was cut out though, in favor of Finnick's broadcast. The message she addressed to Snow gave Plutarch the incredible idea to bring Finnick out and have him share those capital secrets he hinted at in Catching Fire. Well then how do people pay for the pleasure of your company? With secrets. It's such a raw and vulnerable moment for his character as he begins to describe his years of experience as the capital's sex slave. Being seen and introduced as Pan Am's playboy, we learn the disturbing truth that President Snow has been selling his body to buyers and threatened to kill the people he loved if he didn't comply. Yet Finnick was very smart to collect sensitive secrets as a form of payment, ranging from sexual appetites and fantasies to actual evidence of blackmail and criminal activity happening within the capital. There was so much dirt he had on so many officials, but the real treat was when he started talking about Snow and his preferred method of murder during his rise to power. Poison. As soon as I reviewed and reread this portion of the book, my mind immediately clicked back to the scene in Catching Fire when he's backwashing blood in his champagne glass during the fireworks. That threw me off so hard in the last review, completely forgetting that he himself drank his own poison to remove any suspicions, but the lasting effects left him with these blood scented mouth sores and explained why he always wore roses that reeked of perfume. This was such a refreshing reveal dump that perfectly ended the scene in the book, but the movie rearranged things for Katniss to have the last word. As the rebels started losing control over the system, Katniss volunteered to keep the broadcast alive by reaching out to President Snow, who answered after a number of attempts. It's a stronger conversation than the book's Q&A segment with Katniss trying to plead and pretty much tell him what he wanted to hear, but President Snow is no fool, already aware of the rescue team and cuts off the feed to leave Katniss and the rebels no choice but to wait with anxious thoughts. To everyone's surprise though, the rescue team returns with incredible ease. And while everyone is having happy reunions and just feeling relieved to have escaped the capital in one piece, Katniss's reunion with Peeta was heartbreaking. And this thing's a little harder when you remember Snow's final words to her that dug at the wound. It's the things we love most that destroy us. Colonel Boggs had to get involved before Peta choked Katniss to death, and she wakes up again with a neck brace, being told later that peta has been hijacked. BT explains this as a type of fear conditioning involving the venom from those tracker jackers we've seen in the first story. Combine those injections with continuous torture and misdirecting thoughts, the capital was able to turn PETA into someone nobody in this room could ever believe was possible. They turned him into a weapon, Katniss, to kill you. In this final scene, President Coyne announces the liberation of the captured victors and transitions into a speech to inspire the rebels, all while Katniss makes a private visit to Peter's room. As the cheers grow louder, so does Peter's anguish, and Katniss could do nothing but stare at his struggling body in total disbelief.
And this will conclude part one of Mockingjay. Now, before we jump into part two, I want to use this short intermission to remember Philip Seymour Hoffman, who played Plutarch Heavensby. If you're not aware, he unfortunately passed away near the end of filming Mockingjay Part 2. Luckily, the movies were filmed back to back so he was able to perform all of his scenes except for two. He was a very prominent actor but his role here stuck out the most to me. And after looking back at the series, he did a fantastic job bringing Plutarch to life and giving this suave and charismatic presence whenever he was on screen. And I especially love how in these final two parts, they turned this character into like the glue that made this team work. Like he was always compromising between Katniss and President Coin to keep their efforts aligned and focused on the bigger picture. Like that detail never went over my head and it was a believable performance on Hoffman's part. It was a joy to see him again and I'm grateful we got a chance to review and experience his final role as our favorite game maker. You have and will always be dearly missed. Rest in peace Hoffman. Oof. All right. I stretched my legs, rehydrated, so let's jump back in and conclude this story with Mockingjay Part 2. We return to Katniss who's been recovering from Peeta's brutal attack, just now taking off her neck brace. She notices that her voice is practically broken but still feels ready to talk with him again. Plutarch informs her that that kind of request will take some time, and instead shows her the techniques they are using to bring him back. As we have seen, he gets triggered whenever Katniss is in sight. So they are trying to test his composure by sending in random people who aren't closely tied to her or her image. In the book, they started small with strangers and this test that Katniss witnesses was originally a conversation between him and Delhi Cartwright, one of the few District 12 refugees who personally knew him and Katniss growing up. She was described to have a very friendly personality and would have stood a better chance to keep his temper from erupting. Granted, it ended up the same way as the movie, but at least it was a more reasonable outcome than sending Prim right off the bat. It's pretty obvious why the movie used her, a similar reason for why they brought back Effie, but even Hamish acknowledged how her presence was going to set him off. I'm just surprised he didn't lash out as soon as she walked through the door. She's a monster! She's a mud! The capital created to destroy us! However, despite the change, this was a strong cold opening because it perfectly told you everything you needed to know about Katniss's goal and motivation for this second half of the story. It's mostly shown through her facial expressions as she internalized the fact that this isn't PETA anymore, but a twisted game piece created by President Snow. The one thing PETA feared the most actually came true, and against Katniss of all people. I just don't want them to change me. I just don't want to be another piece in their game, you know? The burning hate she already carried for Snow intensified after this latest experiment and the majority of her decisions and choices from here on out would be made to satisfy this personal vendetta. So right after seeing PETA again, she immediately requests to be sent straight to the capital, but settles for District 2 since that is the last remaining district the rebels need to claim. On her way, she's seated by Gale, entering a conversation that, in the book, happened while she was plucking fresh goose. I appreciate this scene being condensed and staying relevant to Gale's insight on Peta's condition, with the movie still trying to keep their romance afloat. The book peeked into Katniss's mind and explained how this kiss was pretty much out of desperation. With Peta in his current state, she plans to die right after killing Snow and tries to encompass all the past kisses she's withheld into this one. And Gale was quick to notice how unfocused it was. It's like kissing someone who's drunk. The book would then take this conversation in a different direction like Katniss actually questioning oh who did you kiss drunk and it's like eh, we don't got time for this we gotta go claim a nut. That'll make sense in a second. The team lands in District 2 and are caught up to speed by one of its victors, Lime, who explains the difficulties of entering the capital's underground stronghold that settled under this large mountain known as the Nut. Ideas are thrown around trying to figure out how to take control, eventually landing on Gale's plan to cause an avalanche and trap everyone inside the Nut. 
It's another example of Gale leaning more into his rebel mindset to do everything he can to win. And in the book, this decision was especially discomforting for Katniss since all she could think about was the mining accident that took both their fathers away. To see that he would be willing to cause a similar incident on a grand scale is concerning, further clashing their viewpoints. It's war, Katniss. Sometimes killing isn't personal. I, of all people, know that it's always personal. By President Coyne's command, they were to cause the avalanche, but also leave an opening through the train tunnel to give the people a chance to surrender themselves. However, things take a turn as a gunshot puts everyone in a panic. And as Katniss rushes to the aid of an injured man, he takes this golden opportunity to hold the Mockingjay at gunpoint. Jennifer Lawrence's delivery on this speech was really strong as she tries to convince this man that they have no reason to kill each other and that all the hate and anger should be directed towards the real threat, President Snow. However, not everyone shares the same sentiment as one Capitol Loyalist shoots around the spot and the scene then jumps to Snow and his party toasting to the fact that the rebels will soon be stepping into a planned trap. Katniss respawns in the District 13 hospital bed, casually chatting and powerless to stop Joanna's new addiction until Haymitch comes by to ask her to talk with Peta, who just finished seeing the footage taken from District 2. This talk shows some improvement with him just by the fact that he can hold a conversation but but still slips into his hostility against her. Like here, he reminisces on the memory of feeding her bread, wondering why he would ever do such a thing. And Katniss tries to bring out that soft and generous side of him, but it's still too early. All I know is that I would have saved myself a lot of suffering if I had just given that bread to the pig. Reminded again of what was taken from her, Katniss once again requests to storm the capital, but is denied. With all the districts now unified, President Coyne saw no further use of the Mockingjay, but still encouraged her to do more propos work around District 13, such as participating in Finnick and Annie's wedding. The book offered more attention to this light-hearted event, such as President Coyne and Plutarch arguing over the budget to match their expectations of a wedding, or how Katniss made use of all the wedding gowns she received from President Snow when catching fire and passed them on to Annie. You know, just filler type moments that lasted for a couple pages. Similar to the year-long break between the movies, this scene felt like a necessary breather for readers to take a break after everything that's happened thus far in the story. However, Katniss can't party while President Snow still lives and decides to just sneak her way to the capital, thanks to Joanna's intel on the shipment of medical supplies heading there. In the book, there was this whole training arc that led to her reaching the capital. The initial reason why President Coyne denied her request was because she lacked the field training. So for three weeks, she and Joanna would speed run this requirement to get approval from the board. It was a well-paced montage that brought Katniss and Joanna a lot closer as friends, like this scene here, which came from this portion of the story. We also see some progress in Peter's treatment as they finally let him out of his bindings to try and interact with his friends again, even allowing him to train as well. Eventually, they are given a final test to put each combatant against their biggest weaknesses. For Katniss, it was her failure to comply and follow orders. For Joanna, it was a standard water flood that brought back traumatic memories of her imprisonment and how the capital tortured her by soaking her body and following it up with electric shocks. Joanna couldn't pass her exam and remained in District 13, while Katniss was placed in Squad 451, the Sharpshooter Squad, or as Cressida calls them the star squad they were not going to play an active role in this war instead they were going to follow behind the front lines and continue filming katniss in action without actually being in action the only action they see comes in the form of pods these traps laid out by the game makers all over the city making it hard for the rebels to advance and reach president snow's mansion luckily for the star squad colonel boggs has this holograph that points out all known pods in the the vicinity. They still will have to tread carefully for pods that the holograph didn't register, but they had enough of a guidance to feel safe. And in the case of being captured, each member was equipped with their own nightlock capsule to kill themselves as a last resort. With all this in mind, our star squad was ready to take part in their final mission. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the 76th Hunger Games.
The start of this journey is pretty sluggish as they continue filming and triggering pods along the way. Prior to this, Katniss and Gale had made a pact to go rogue and finish off President Snow themselves, and began to strategize how to take the holograph from Colonel Boggs until they were gifted a new squad member. Okay, stop. Hold up. In the book, his addition to the team was because one of the League sisters died from a pod that unleashed metal darts, so the district sent him as a replacement. Though the movie found a clever way to add him without sacrificing a squad member early on. President Coyne did not like how Katniss snuck herself into the capital, and instead of just removing her, she decided to make the most of this situation and hope it would lead to one specific outcome. There's only one thing you could do now to add more fire to this rebellion. Die. The Mockingjay's services are no longer required. The fires of rebellion are burning so brightly now that all Katniss could do at this point is become a martyr. And with Peeta there and by her side, there's a good chance that President Coin could finally get rid of the only girl with any chance of opposing her. However, Peeta has been progressively getting better from his tracker jacker trance. But at this point, Katniss has fully convinced herself that Peeta is nothing more but a capital mutt and wants nothing more than to kill Snow for what he's done. It took a conversation from Haymitch in the book to convince her to keep trying with Peeta. Because as far as he knows, he has no clue about President Coin's intentions or President Snow's intentions. He's just a victim in this terrible situation. And if the roles were reversed, they both know that Peeta would do everything in his power to bring Katniss back. So it's only right for her to at least make an effort. This conversation is still difficult, more so because Peeta is having trouble with distinguishing the real memories from the fake ones. So Phoenix suggests that he rely on his team to help him sort out his thoughts, beginning the game of real or not real. I like the book going into more detail about this game and seeing the squad make a collaborative effort to reassure Peeta on factual events. Like Gale tells him stuff about District 12, Finnick fills him in on both his Hunger Games, but a lot of his confusion revolves around Katniss, leaving her to be the one to sort out the more personal details. But as the movie shows, even the most basic facts and superficial details about his life were too much for her to think back on. You were right. I can't do this. She returns to her main goal of killing Snow, but won't get anywhere without that holograph. Unfortunately for her, that desire manifests itself in the worst way possible next scene. The movie plays this area off like it was part of their path, but apparently in the book, President Coin appointed this location specifically for the Star Squad. Since the footage they had so far was dull and uninspiring, they were sent here with some unactivated pods to capture some decent action, which they do, but a little more than what they were expecting. In his final moments, Boggs transfers command of the holograph over to Katniss and urges her to do what she came here to do before passing away. And as if things couldn't get any worse, one of the League sisters accidentally triggers a literal Tide Pod made of this black tar-like substance. As everyone's rushing to safety, Peter loses himself and tries to drag Katniss down, resulting in the death of one of the soldiers, Mitchell. Eventually he's controlled and they all rush inside one of the buildings to gain height and avoid the trap. But even after the tar goes away, the squad ends up pointing guns at each other when Katniss refuses to give up the holograph. And this led her to make a decision that, to this day, most fans cannot forgive her for. I'm on special orders from Coin. To do what? To assassinate President Snow. With the only item she needed to reach Snow, she wasn't going to pass up this opportunity. If she had her way and snuck off with Gale as planned, the casualties wouldn't have played out the way they did. But now that she's been put in this position, she has a choice to make. Return to base or follow through to reach Snow's mansion. It also doesn't help that Boggs' last words influence her decision to keep going, so she stands with her lie, and with Cressida's support, Lieutenant Jackson eventually agrees to follow Katniss' lead. I also found it funny that this agreement in the book was followed up with Katniss knowing absolutely nothing about how to even work the holograph and immediately asks Jackson for help, which was the initial reason for having this line. Boggs promised me that when the time came you would help me. 
Speaking of bugs, in the book, they manage to carry his body inside with them, but still end up leaving him behind when it's time to move. In the movie, one of the sisters can't go on because of her injury, so they both stay behind, while the rest of the Star Squad escape before the peacekeepers arrive and terminate the area. They remain still for a while, watching numerous broadcasts of Caesar declaring their deaths, the traditional roll call listing the deceased, and President Snow sparing a few words until President Coin interrupts his message with a eulogy of her own for the Mockingjay. And I love how Katniss does not care in the slightest. Like as soon as President Coin is done, she immediately goes, Snow's in his mansion. Where is that? With all these pods littering the streets, their only option was to move underground. With Pollux as their guide since this was his workplace in the capital for 5 years, knowing the pathways that can get them to Snow's mansion. They get far enough to take a break, and during Katniss's watch, she and Peeta engage in another round of real or not real. This conversation is a little more vague than the book, only because they address characters that never appeared, specifically the punished Avoxes. But it still rounds back to Peeta starting to sort out the truth and confirming that Katniss is still willing to protect them. However, that would get really difficult as President Snow is notified of the Star Squad still being alive and sends a little surprise that forces them into a quiet escape. These faceless mutts chase the squad in this high intensity action scene, losing Jackson and Pollux's brother Castor in the process, while our main characters are holding their own. With the dark lighting, the claustrophobic space, and the choreography, this scene did so good in bringing out the complete terror of these creatures and the atmosphere of the battle. Eventually, they start climbing up the ladder to safety except for Finnick, who was the last one still fighting and launched his trident to protect Katniss, leaving him with just a knife and his fleeting luck. But sadly, it ends miserably, and all Katniss could do for him was activate the holograph's self-destruct function and make his death a swift one. They return to the surface to escape even more peacekeepers and pods, such as this beam of light that literally disintegrates Mesala on sight and the floor collapsing by what the book described as the meat grinder. This scene was rearranged from the book as it happened during their escape from the sewer muds, and the place where they actually resurfaced was inside the home of a random capital citizen, with Katniss shooting her dead on sight. I can understand why they would cut this out, she's got enough on her plate, she just lost countless people going through this lie, including a fan favorite, so adding another death on her hands would seem cruel at this point. The rearrangement worked for me and ends on a sweeter note as the relationship between Katniss and Peta is starting to look hopeful. Look at me! Look at me! Stay with me. Oh, yes. Because she's familiar with these streets, Cressida leads the team to a trusted boutique shop owned by this woman named Tigress, or better known as President Snow's cousin. It's better I say this now and just try to reduce the span of comments telling me who this is supposed to be. She offers the Star Squad a safe place to rest, recover, and grieve over their recent losses, leading Katniss to confess her lie, but they all knew. They all played along and followed her lead. And what Peter says here is so powerful, not just because he's uplifting the mood and making the deaths of their friends and allies mean something, but it was done to cheer Katniss up. There's no bitter tone, no sporadic lash out, our golden bread boy has returned to his senses and remembers just how much Katniss means to him and all of Pan Am. They chose this. They chose you. Afterwards, they try to get some sleep, but Katniss can't help but listen in on her last remaining options, talking like bros, talking each other up to see who deserves Katniss the most, but Gail keeps taking shots at her character and says that she'll just pick whoever she can't survive without. It isn't long until they have to move out once they start hearing the rebels nearby, leading President Snow to offer up his space for the capital citizens and a chance for the squad to reach him. In the book, they were hiding for a little bit longer until Snow's announcement also came with the request of shopkeepers to lend their floor space, pushing them to act quickly and discreetly. Originally, all of them were going to disguise themselves with the public, but the movie kept it to just Katniss and Gale, leaving the rest of the squad to stay back. Peta wants to go, but is convinced to stay back, giving Gale's nightlock pill in case he's captured again, and is released from his shackles to visually complete his rehabilitation and give Katniss a farewell hug before going their separate ways. 
She and Gail make their way towards the capital in this very tense scene as they avoid eye contact with the locals and are almost closed in by these mandatory inspections until the rebels arrive and throw the whole plan into chaos. They try their best to get through the assault but end up separating from each other after an explosion with Gail being captured and having no pill to rely on. In the book, they were separated by an activated pod that blew this massive seam down the center of the block, with Gale hanging onto an apartment door until a peacekeeper caught him. In that situation, it made sense why Katniss couldn't hear his request to shoot him, unlike the movie where she's in literal earshot. One could say she just hesitated because it was Gail, but I'm convinced that she just didn't want to blow her chance with the mansion being so close. She approached with caution, seeing the crowd thicken and offered up their children for safer chances until a capital hovercraft flies by and delivers gifts from above. All the citizens reach their hands out to receive their gifts that were stuffed with an explosive surprise. The first wave leaves Katniss dazed, seeing the remains of the dead and injured bodies and the arrival of both peacekeepers and rebel medics coming in to provide support where they can. And as if the situation couldn't be any more damned, Katniss finds her baby sister Prim in the center of the aftermath and desperately calls her name before the second set of gifts are delivered. Now, from what I know, this book gets a lot of hate for its ending. I don't know at which point exactly, maybe here, maybe in the epilogue, maybe both, but in any case, I'm going to explain my thoughts on each one. Starting with this scene, after everything they went through and everyone they lost to reach this point, this whole plan literally went up in flames and became meaningless without a payoff. This all could have been avoided, but Katniss followed her path to vengeance only to have it blow up in her face. The supposed heroine of the story didn't get what she wanted, didn't end the war by her own hands, and failed to provide us with the happy ending we all expected her to have. And to that, I say, good. I think fans have forgotten or don't want to acknowledge that Katniss has been painted and placed on this pedestal to be the hero when in reality she has always been the victim first and one who continuously acted on her instincts to simply survive and watch out for her own. Put a look into you, Katniss. I don't want anyone looking to me. I never asked for this. I never asked to be in the games. She's just a regular girl caught between both sides of this massive war, having been used, commercialized, and always forced to stay distrustful and stuck in survival mode 24-7. And don't get me wrong, this bothers me too. Mainly for the fact that after following her for three books, she doesn't learn anything. Here we are in the final story and it feels like her character still has that book one loner behavior. Like she hasn't retained any life lessons or new motives since the start of her journey. But the reason why I like this ending is because it's complex. There's a lot that can be examined from the direction of this outcome, like the result of blind rage or a commentary on the unpredictability of war. It can be looked at from various angles and makes for good discussion. I would have been all for a happy ending that just led towards a brighter future, but the one that Collins wrote didn't betray the fans, but rather supported her main character by giving her what she needed. During this moment in the book, Katniss is in immense pain and enters this very poetic monologue as she's processing her grief, visualizing herself as a mockingjay that lost her fiery spirit mid-flight, landing in this purgatory sea and allowing herself to be dragged down towards a dark and empty space. It is a clear case of suicidal ideation. She desperately wants to die at this moment, but life keeps pulling her back in the form of her mother. She's back in the hospital bed with Hamish there to inform her that the rebels claimed victory after the bombing and took control of the throne without much fuss. She takes a look around the mansion after healing, spying a frozen greenhouse that, as described in the book, carried this heavy scent of roses that piqued her interest. Guards are standing watch, denying their access until Commander Paler from District 8 pardons it, knowing that she of all people deserved to see what's inside. The colors are lovely, of course, but nothing says perfection like white. This conversation is my absolute favorite scene from this story. 
Katniss finally has President Snow right where she wants him, caged and imprisoned with nowhere to run. More so through Katniss's perspective and just what we have witnessed in this series, there is enough reason and evidence to hate this man and everything that comes to him will be totally deserved. But once he starts talking, it feels like his final desperation move. In his delicate calculating manner, he first offers his condolences for Prim's death before making the claim that the bombings were orchestrated by the rebels, and that President Coyne took advantage of both Katniss and Snow's fixation on each other so she could slide in and take the throne. Now there's enough evidence to support this idea. The bombings, and which I'll explain momentarily, are hard evidence, along with the motives behind President Coin's actions. Like I am 99.5% sure that this was a rebel tactic, but that 0.5% of doubt was solely created by this character. He is not one to lie, almost everything he says or does always has a purpose. When he's talking about how wasteful the deaths of those children were, being someone who's not above child murder in the slightest, there is some truth there. Especially when you consider this conversation from the first movie. Why do you think we have a winner? I mean, if we just wanted to intimidate the districts, why not round up 24 of them at random and execute them all at once? I have every reason to believe his words, but the way Collins developed his character and the way Donald Sutherland delivered this amazing performance, it affected me in such a way where I am still second guessing myself on what the truth really is. Katniss herself spent time thinking back on this conversation, trying to wrap her head around the facts until she reunited with Gale and confronted him about the bombs. The book handled this pretty nonchalantly, like he doesn't confirm or deny it and doesn't see a reason to since it's something that she'll always be thinking about. The movie took a colder approach that appeared as if this is what all their previous scenes were leading up to. This will also be their last time seeing each other since Gale will end up staying in District 2 as a military leader. As for a definitive answer, there's enough in both parts and one deleted scene to point the finger at him, but allow me to hammer in the final nail on this coffin by reading the passage from the book when she saw one of his projects with BT. It's less about the mechanics of the trap than the psychology behind them. Booby trapping an area that provides something essential to survive, a water or food supply. Frightening prey so that a large number flee to a greater destruction. Endangering offspring in order to draw in the actual desired target, the parent. Luring the victim into what appears to be a safe haven where death awaits. In other words, Goodbye Gail. She closes the door on this friendship and enters a meeting between President Coin and all that's left of the victors. On top of executing Snow within the same afternoon, they are also trying to find the proper punishment for the capital citizens that would best satisfy the other districts, landing on the idea to hold another Hunger Games using the children of the capital as tributes. The votes end up being half and half, leaving Katniss and Haymitch to make the final verdict. On the condition that she'll kill Snow, she votes yes in Prim's name, and Haymitch follows behind her decision. It is not until the very last moment where we see Katniss had planned to kill President Coyne instead, and it's only in the book where you get a stronger sense of what she was thinking during this decision. Taking a long hard look at Snow, she doesn't see any sign of fear or remorse or anger but amusement that reminded her of their last conversation and the last words he left her with. I thought we'd agreed never to lie to each other. In the end, she decided to trust his words and shoot down another dictator in the making. She tried taking her own life until PETA intervened and allowed her to be taken away while the people decided Snow's fate with their own hands. And a large portion of this imprisonment in the book gets real depressing that she's confined while people are deciding how to move forward with this incident. The act of killing herself is now deemed, by her own terms, as the capital's privilege. She undergoes withdrawal symptoms from the lack of morphine in her system and settles with the bare minimum of resources until Haymitch is there to release her. In the book, this scene originally took place on the hovercraft that was taking her back to District 12, with both Haymitch and Plutarch explaining the outcomes of her trial. However, because of Hoffman's passing, the movie did a real sweet touch to keep the scene simple and giving the entire conversation to him, 
with the help of Woody Harrelson as the messenger. And just to sum up both the contents of this letter and the future for these other characters, here's the main gist of it all. Commander Paler has been appointed as the new president of Pan Am, carrying the hope that things will be different this time as they follow a more democratic approach for their society. Katniss's mom will be staying in District 4 to help with the medical unit because there is nothing for her left in District 12 but painful memories. Katniss was sentenced to live out the rest of her days in District 12, accompanied by Haymitch and a handful of characters from the book, like Greasy Sai, who would watch over her and just try to rebuild their hometown. It wasn't as bleak as it appeared in the movie, but it still pushed the point that even though the war is now over, all that's left is the pain and trauma she carried, finally set off by the cat she despised the most this whole series. <laughs> Such a rough ending, and no one can deny that, but in its own way, it still carries a trail of beauty in its message. A happier ending would have been nice, but I think in doing so, it would have been harder to create that balance between Katniss getting what she wanted versus what she needed. I honestly can't imagine her story ending without getting the proper time and support needed to process all the suffering and heartache she had to bottle away. Seeing Buttercup was the perfect catalyst to help her release these emotions because while he is a painful reminder of Prim, he's also the token that keeps her memory alive. And Katniss recognizes their similar loss and finally embraces him. It was both a huge moment for their relationship and a subtle start to following a peaceful path. From here on out, more so in the book, the story focuses on the healing process, spanning across months as she slowly begins to adjust to a peaceful world, which gets a whole lot better when Peter returns home, sprucing up the place with a bed of primroses he found. It may not have been the ending everyone wanted, but it was the best one she could have hoped for, and one that Effie would have been proud to see. Promise me you'll find it. Find what? The life of a victor. Sometimes the victory isn't as grand or amazing as you'd want it to be. To someone who's lived their whole lives fighting and surviving just to see another day, a quiet life and some peace of mind can be the greatest award given. And with a strong support system and surrounded by good friends and company, Katniss allows peace to fully transform her life, as evident by the epilogue showing her now as a mom with two kids. In the beginning of the story, she couldn't even fathom bringing kids into this messed up world. A life like that was never possible with the existence of present snow or the Hunger Games. So to see this ending, it said all you needed to know about the future state of Pan Am. And it wasn't an easy choice for her either. As described in the book, it took roughly 15 years to finally be persuaded. Most would have given up, but not the Riz Master himself, fueled by the fact that he now knows her love for him is without a doubt real. And that, my friends, is the ending to Mockingjay and the entire Hunger Games trilogy. Looking at both parts, there were opportunities to shorten the narrative and release it as one movie. Because they made a lot of changes I can't help but see motivated by greed, which I can't really blame them for. The Hunger Games had as much fame as the Harry Potter franchise to split this finale into two parts, but the issue with this model was that both parts would have to have an equal amount of entertainment, which wasn't the case here. The first half of Mockingjay wasn't nearly as exciting as the second half, only made worse when they decided to stretch out the events from within the one month time skip and deconstruct the perfect summarization that was already in place. Exploring the slow rift between Katniss and Gale could have worked, but they tried too hard to keep the romance afloat for as long as they could, even when the plot continuously tried to break them apart, resulting in this disjointed mess of will they won't they. You know what these movies needed? Montages. I could envision one being used for the propos assignments, maybe another to cover the training arc with Joanna. There were just a lot of slow moments that didn't need to be dragged out to pad the runtime, and could have used more film techniques to condense the material and enhance the movie experience. 
But there were some stuff I liked too. I like what they did with the air raid scene because it brought more intensity than the book's portrayal. Like the previous installments, the additional scenes that expanded from the first person narrative were well chosen and fleshed out more of this world and its characters. But above all else, the performances were the real highlight of this conclusion. Particularly Jennifer and Donald who had some of the strongest scenes whether or not they were sharing them together. If there's anything I will take away from these movies, it's just the memory of how well these two acted their butts off to deliver such a believable and powerful performance. But in all honesty, even if these movies were combined into one, I still think it wouldn't have held a candle to the book. This was a story that needed the extra details from the book to describe the thoughts and rationality behind some of these choices. Without them, District 13 as a setting lacked personality and didn't stand out like it did in the book. This was the story where the trauma needed to be fully explored to bring out the effectiveness of that ending. I didn't have much concern for it in Catching Fire because it wasn't the focus, but still in the process of building up within Katniss. It was only in Mockingjay once everything was over that it became necessary to address that trauma, which Collins carefully handled in the book. And for the way the story ended, I have no wishes with it because at the end of the day, it wasn't written for me or you. Sure, we had our kicks with the battle royale portions and watching Katniss dismantle the capital time and time again, but this series had always been aimed for a specific group of people who to this day are still finding themselves in hopeless situations. It's more than your average YA dystopian and it's more than a piece of social commentary. It's a hopeful message to the thousands of victims that can relate to Katniss. For the survivors who have no choice but to endure and live through the stacked odds against them. It's a story that says there's still life worth living beyond the chaos. Even after surviving the shittiest of circumstances, you are not defined by your trauma and you can still achieve a peaceful life. I have the utmost respect for Collins sticking with this decision. It wasn't the most favorable, but it is the most impactful. And I'm sure it did an amazing job to make a whole generation of victims and survivors seen. A great series is one that leaves a lasting impression. And with the Hunger Games series, there is a lot to come back to. From the battle royale concepts to the infinite discussions you can have on Pan Am and its messages, this was an incredible ride and I hope the franchise continues to expand the universe and explore more stories such as what Collins did with the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. But that's for another day. As for now, these are my final thoughts on Mockingjay. And as always, it's just one man's opinion. So what'd you guys think of the book and or movie? Be sure to leave a like, subscribe, comment your thoughts down below, and I'll see y'all in the next review. Take care.